All right, Tessa, you want to introduce and then I'll follow up with some of our little Zoom hints before we get started officially? Absolutely. Thanks, Dara. Okay. Yeah, uh, my name is Tessie Austin. I am the uh, technical account manager for the Arizona EVB program. I work hand in hand with uh, Dara and Danielle pretty much, I'd say, on a daily basis. Um, I've been with the, uh, the program and the account with Sandata for a little over a year, about a year and four months. Um, so we are super excited. Uh, Dara and I have uh, spent a lot of time working to get the Alt EVV vendor specifications and the um, business rules for Arizona kind of aligned and uh, concise to help you guys out. So we are super excited today to present this and to kind of touch on some things that um, are changed or updated or maybe just a little more clarification on some things. So, uh, and I think we're gonna kind of try to keep it to, you know, specific things about the alt EVV vendor specifications um, and not really more, you know, it's not really about how to use EVV or uh, specific policy unless it relates to some of what we're gonna talk about. I know Dara's gonna kind of touch on that. Um, I also have uh, our project manager, Amanda Scanlon, helping us out running the PowerPoint. So she'll be helping catch questions with Danielle and I'm gonna turn it over to Dara. To Dara. All right, so just a couple of things. I know we're all pretty used to meeting like this, but just in case we're not, um, we've muted everybody upon entry. Um, it's preferable to only join by either phone or computer. Um, and we'll uh, primarily use the chat feature today. I think we have um, over close to 200 people um, in, the, uh, in the meeting. So we wanna, um, using the chat feature will be the best way for us to communicate. Um, we are going to hold questions till the end of the presentation. The presentation should be about a half an hour or so, and then that leaves us quite a bit of room um, to ask questions. So if you're like me, you're gonna forget the question that you have. <laughs> um, go ahead and put it in the chat feature um, using the chat, and then um, Amanda and Danielle will monitor that. And um, when we get to the Q&A session, we'll kind of go back and start from the beginning. Um, so next slide, please. Hold on, Daniel. Dare, hold on. My computer is fighting with me. Okay. Oops, now I'm jumping ahead. There we go. Okay. So we are recording the webinar. Um, this is, uh, so we're gonna put it up on the website. So if for some reason um, that's of concern to you, then um, you can dismiss yourself in the meeting. But um, we just wanted to let everybody know with full transparency that we are recording the webinar. So these are just a little bit about the Zoom webinar controls. Um, the mute um, on the left here that you see on the screen is obviously very important. You should be muted, so you should be okay. Um, if you need to turn on the closed captioning, then we have um, to show you how to do that. Um, raise hand or the chat feature, primarily just again, because of the volume of the folks in today's meeting, we're gonna try to stay with the chat feature. Right? And um, here's just a, a hint about the audio and how to join um, and how to mute yourself and things like that if you're unfamiliar. And just for a second. Do you want me to go back? Nope. Go ahead, you can uh, go to the next slide. All right, thanks, Dara. I'll, I'll take back over here. We kind of have laid out an agenda, uh, kind of be some back and forth with Dara and myself. Um, we're gonna you know, specifically talk about an overview of the vendor process, some additions and changes, uh, talk about the, the specifications and then JSON, common issues, best practices, a few things on future updates, reviews, resources. And then like Dara said, we'll take your questions and give you some answers at the end. And I apologize, I failed to mention, uh, we also have uh, one of the uh, one of our tier three uh, support folks, uh, Carolyn Ostrom on with us um, to keep me in check and make sure I'm giving you guys the right answers because she's the one that, that takes the, uh, the tickets and, and works with our vendors day in and day out. So thank you, Carolyn, for joining. So let's talk about the Alt EV process overview. So you guys, I know are pros at this, so I'm not gonna like read this to you, plus we're recording, um, but there's a few things we just wanted to kind of point out to make sure that everybody um, is on the same page. Uh, 
So kind of with the process overview, uh, the biggest thing to remember is that in 99% of the cases, the providers um, are the ones actually initiating the request to have their all TVV vendor um, send their data to send data. So that's where the process starts. The request is sent to the email that you see here on the screen, azaltevv at sandata.com. That email address is gonna be your best friend. Um, once that, excuse me, comes in from a provider, that starts the process. The provider at that point is kind of out of the picture for a little bit. Um, and then there's a couple of paths that can happen. The first one is if, if it's a new vendor to the Arizona program that isn't certified with Sandata, then we get some information from that vendor. We reach out, uh, ask them some questions, give them some information and some testing credentials and a checklist. So the vendor then takes that, does what they need to do back and forth, maybe with our support team. Um, and then however long that takes them, they then complete the certification uh, with the, the pieces of information you can see on the bottom part of that, that slide. They return that checklist, we review it, and then if you'll go to the next one. And then the, the process kind of merges back up. So the other two things were for new vendors. If it's a vendor that's already been certified with Sandata and has gone through that checklist, completed everything, um, or if, they, if it's a new vendor and they complete it, then we distribute credentials to the provider. Um, the provider then, is also may have to do some training if they haven't done it before um, so that they can then and then they get their credentials to log into the aggregator to look at the information. Um, the providers then can log in and look at the stuff the vendor sends. The vendor uses their credentials to send for the provider and then that's kind of where it all joins back up and then everybody's happy and we can get things rolling. So just a little bit about that just kind of wanted to go over uh, just a general overview of it. Um, and certainly, like I said before, we're going to repeat that email address several times, uh, alt, az, alt, evv at sandata.com. So that's kind of where it all starts. So looking at the next section, uh, we've got um, a couple of things that are, are maybe some, just some call outs, some additions and changes to the specifications. We have updated the specifications, and I believe they are uh, posted on the Arizona EVB website. Uh, we're on version 15, if you're keeping up with them. Um, we have some updated information in that document, really around the descriptions and the expected values. And this is where our tier three team and Carolyn really came into play. They were able to provide us information from the tickets and the you know issues that have occurred. And we were kind of able to align our specifications across all of our programs. Um, so that we're kind of, if you, if you are a vendor that works in multiple states, there's some things that are going to be Arizona specific. But you're going to see, hopefully going forward, that our specifications kind of give you the same type of information on things that are general. Um, there's references in our this specification document to the AZ EVV business rules for policy requirements that DARA and team have put together. So we've tried to reference their document in our specs. They reference the specs in their document. So we're hoping that'll help you guys. Um, we've also listed the claims validation rules with the service and modifiers. The short visit exception is, is removed currently, so there's, there's no exception for short visit. That may be back in the future. Um, and then the appendix has some information on errors provided. So that's kind of the update on the specifications. In the middle column, you see some information about some services that are starting January 1st, 2023. We did go ahead and list those in the uh, specifications. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then we've got some services that are, are removed as of now. They're, Still, in, they're, they're not in the specifications at all. Um, that one, those are listed. They're the H2014 with various modifiers. And I believe everybody already had that communication. So we just aligned the specifications to that. So if you'll move to the next slide, please, Amanda. I want to spend just a minute on this because I just advised you guys that we are, uh, we have put in a concerted effort to kind of reference the AZ EVV business rules for policy requirements and the specification. So on this screen, you're like, you may say, well, okay, that's great, but I see there's some things that are optional in your addendum or specifications, but then the Arizona EVV rules are requiring them. So let's just spend a short minute on that because I think it's really, really important. 
And this is a good example of one. I just put one example on here for us to use. So schedules, everybody's favorite, right? Are required for the visits in the EVV program business rules, right? A Arizona has said a visit should have a schedule to be in compliance with the program. And I think Dara's gonna speak to this a little bit. But the specifications, the schedule uh, elements are optional. Now, what that means is they're optional in terms of a visit could be um, completed and in our system and accepted by our interface without that. But the difference is that because of the business rules for Arizona, your program is not going to be in compliance if the schedule information isn't there. Dara, did you want to add anything on, on some of this information regarding the optional specs versus required items in the rules? No, I just want to, I'll kind of highlight it a little bit later too, but we'll, that, that's really why it's very, very important to look at both documents together um, because that will, that will clarify a lot of things. And as Tessie said, we reference one document to the other document. So that's why it's really, really important that not only the, that the vendors, all TVV vendors look at both documents, but also the providers. Um, so I'll, I'll reinforce that a little bit at the end, but, but um, great example, Tessie. Awesome. I just want to point out one more thing um, on the schedule piece. Um, the schedule information for the specifications for the, the, the JSON message that you're going to be sending, it can be delivered with the visit. I know this has come up um, previously and we've had some questions around it. It's not required to be sent prior to the visit occurring uh, or separately from the visit. You can, you can send the schedule which could be different from the visit times. And we can get into more specifics about that later if you have specific questions. But um, I think most people are, are, are pretty good with that, but we just wanted to kind of reiterate that. So Amanda, if you'll move on and I will turn it over to Dara for a moment. Great, thank you. Um, so the one thing as Tessie just pointed out, some of the more substantive changes, which are pretty, um, uh, fairly minor changes. I do want to highlight that the only changes that need to be made before the hard edit date are those service codes and adding the new service code um, and some of the modifier combinations. Um, and I believe we'll show you later what those are, but those are really the only things that have to be completed, developed in production um, for hard edits because they do impact the hard edit. So I just wanted to reiterate, and we'll talk at the very end of the presentation about um, how we're gonna go about setting a timeline for the other items to be in production. Amanda, if you can go to the next slide. And clarification. So um, as we, uh, I think previously we published the, uh, updated the specs, the original specifications, I believe back in August of 2020. Um, seems like yesterday, but also seems like a very long time ago. So one of the things that we really tried to tackle um, as Tessie and I worked together to update the specifications and the business requirements crosswalk was to clarify a few things. So these are kind of the three major things that we clarified. All of what's on the slide right here is actually in that business requirements crosswalk, um, as well as there's elements of it in the technical specifications as well. So as Tessie mentioned, um, we, we aren't rejecting your data that comes in if it doesn't have a schedule. But when you think of policy compliance, here's what we're looking for from a compliance standpoint. Um, either a schedule must be sent with the visit data, or um, the visit must, if it doesn't have a schedule, it must have the unscheduled visit exception, which must be cleared with the reason and resolution code to explain why the visit was unscheduled. Um, and we, um, we outlined some examples in that uh, visit maintenance and uh, documentation FAQ that we recently published, which we've also got referenced in some resources at the end of the slide. So that's really what we're looking for for compliance. When it comes to exceptions, um, other clarifications that we made, which some exceptions may require a manual edit or an adjustment, 
which should be notated by a reason and resolution code. Um, in order to clear an exception, some of them are just acknowledgeable, and I believe Tessie's going to go into that in a little bit. Um, but even if they're if, if you don't really have to necessarily do anything to the visit to get it to a verified state, when you acknowledge it, you still need to use the region and resolution code. And depending upon the circumstance, a memo within the system might be required. So a note or a memo. And that again is really defined in that visit maintenance and audit documentation FAQ. Specifically regarding this process of exceptions. One of the things that we're seeing is that um, we believe anyway, that when you all are sending data, most of you are just sending us the data after it, it, after the visit has all the information that's required. And what we really need for compliance um, is we need you to provide us the entire life cycle of records, any adjustments, any edits made to the visit. Um, and those updates must be sent each time the visit is edited. And the reason why this is important, one, for transparency, two, is because we actually have to report data to CMS on how uh, often visits are auto-verified, meaning all the information was captured at the point of service delivery or um, visits that had to have manual adjustments. And so we have to have an accurate picture of this, and we feel strongly that we, that we don't currently, um, that we probably look a little bit better than we actually are. So we really do need you to provide us um, all of this information. We have to have the audit trail. So again, these are clarifications. These items were in the original specifications and in the original business requirements. We've just offered these clarifications um, due to some of the questions and things that we were getting. Uh, um, over the course of the last few years and even most recently. So Tessie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Dara. Awesome, so we're gonna talk briefly about uh, the addendum and the JSON messages that are being sent. Um, I'm sure you are all familiar with the link on how to get to uh, the addenda uh, for the program uh, the, on the azaccess.gov website. Um, Kind of a just a general overview, the Alt EVV addenda are broken into three major sections, and those are the three data points um, that you that you send to us, client, employee, and visit. And uh, that order, remember that order, it's going to be important. We're going to talk about that some more too. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and go to this next section. Now, again, you guys are pros at this, and I don't want to you know drag this out, but I do want to just point out a few things and make sure that um, everybody understands and everybody, if, if you have a question that you can ask. So the client overview, um, we have, there's two required segments, client general and client address. We need to know who you're sending and like where they are pretty much. Um, we have a couple of identifiers that we use for matching logic. These are in the, the specifications, a provider ID value, which is the six digit or six character, sorry, ID that Arizona uses for the providers, um, can be left padded with zero. So that's really important. Um, and then a client identifier, which is the client Medicaid ID. Um, there are op optional segments that are in this, uh, the client data point, um, such as client phone, which we would highly recommend that you associate with your client record, but they are optional. We're going to talk a little bit about how the specifications look in just a moment. Um, the identifiers for the clients, the pro providers and clients are there, you know, to ensure that the data gets to the correct place. We want it getting to that provider's account for that member so that everything then flows smoothly after that. Um, so let's move on to the next screen, please. So we're kind of gonna go through this breakdown on each of those um, segments, the, the client, employee, and the visit. Um, and what we have here on the screen, and you'll see this is kind of a, if you haven't looked at the updated specifications yet, this is kind of the format. Um, the, the elements didn't change, but we have changed some of the information. Um, and how it's presented and tried to make it a little bit easier for you guys um, overall. So across the top in blue, you see the columns. Uh, those are, are still the same columns, element description, max link type, whether it's required or not, which is a really, a really important one. And then an expected value. So, and then on the far right, you're gonna see like a, just a snippet out of, of a JSON. So you can see how the specifications um, align to the JSON. Uh, the JSON's got the key pair values that we're looking for based on the elements and the values that are expected. Um, 
remember that, like I said, the one of the most important columns is that required column. Um, you've got yes, which means it's required, optional, which is optional, pretty self-explanatory. Um, if it's optional, um, an empty string or a null value, or it can just be left out of the elements if it's not something that you code for. Um, so if you don't use the middle initial, if you don't have that capture or, or anywhere, then I'm gonna have to say it's optional. You also see some things highlighted that say do not provide. Um, we're not looking for you to include those in, in your JSON at all. If for some reason you do code to them um, and you do have them, you must send those as null. Uh, we, we assign the client ID. We've recently made the change to this missing Medicaid ID to make sure that uh, that's not something that, that causes confusion. Um, and, and so make sure, you know, if you have special situations that you need to talk to us about, we'll be happy to work with you via email. Um, and then like with the address, uh, kind of what we were talking about with address, phone, those kind of things. You can have multiple uh, addresses like home, other, multiple phone numbers, home, mobile. So those do have child segments. Um, and those are really important. And I think most of you are familiar with the actual format, JSON kind of stuff. So I'm not going to belabor that too much for you. So that's the client overview. Let's move down to the employee. Very similar to what we just saw in the client segment. Difference here is that um, we're looking for the employee identifier, which is the full uh, nine digit SSN and that format you can see there. Um, this is really important because if we don't, if we get a, an employee ID identifier that we already have, then we know that that's an update to a record. If we don't have it, then we know it's a new record and we need to insert it. So just to call out on that, we'll kind of move on to the next one. I'm gonna move through these because I think you guys are, are pretty good on uh, the actual JSON just kind of want to kind of point some things out. So let's move to the next piece, please. Again, just like we saw on the client, we've got the specs on the left, the JSON on the right. Um, the employee qualifier, if you look on uh, the element number one or index number one of the element employee qualifier, we've told you on the very far right in the expected value exactly what we want to see. And you can see that in the JSON. We show employee SSN in quotes because it's a string. Um, and then on the employee identifier, we're expecting the, the full SSN. It's also a string, so that's in quotes. Um, another piece just to point out real quick, you see the uh, item number three, the sequence ID. Again, pretty sure you guys are familiar with this. Um, we recommend using a date timestamp as a unique sequence ID. This really allows us to make sure we're processing records in an ordered fashion. We wanna make sure as we receive the records that we process them properly and the sequence ID allows us to do that. Again, it's an uh, integer, um, so there's no quotations around it as you can see in the yellowish on the right there. So just a little bit of call outs on the employee. We will move on to the visit. You have one required segment for visit. It's a little bit different. There are some conditional segments. Um, for the visit records. And this kind of goes back to what Dara and I were talking about before, visit exceptions, visit changes, uh, calls. So those are kind of spelled out for you, but the big ones that most folks uh, are have questions on or look about, look for answers about are exceptions and changes. Again, we've listed the identifiers, excuse me, that um, we use for the matching logic for the, for the visit. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about the two, con two of the conditional segments briefly. Remember visit exceptions, that's a segment that has to be sent if you're acknowledging an exception, like we spoke about previously, um, within the visit itself. We know that if we have an exception that's going to be triggered because there's some data information missing, that this segment is used in particular to acknowledge that information along with reason and resolution code. There's some things in there that are are required then if that segment is uh, needed. That's why it's conditional. Um, again, we're not expecting that to be sent in every transmission, but we're expecting visit exceptions to be sent to us when that when something is uh, needs to be acknowledged or fixed or whatever the case may be. Um, visit changes again. This is their adjustments to electronically collected visit data, such as adjusted date in and time. Um, it's applicable for any of the visit exception acknowledgements as well, um, because these are basically manual interactions with visit data. This also includes manual calls, since this isn't an electronically collected visit. 
And uh, if you go to the next screen for me, Amanda, um, this one may be a little harder to see right now just because I, I put a bigger screenshot on the page. Um, but you can you can see um, the information there. And like I said, we've tried to in that far right column on the on the specifications, we've tried to give some uh, clarification on the expected values, formatting, um, what we're really looking for to make sure people have a better example. In the middle column, this is where you'll start seeing maybe some information on uh, if it, it goes back to the, the documents that Dara was speaking of, um, or if there's, if there's other information that needs to be looked at or maybe added uh, along, the, along the line. Also, I wanna make a call out here again, Probably you guys are, are familiar with this, but in the JSON, remember that you can have the elements ordered any way it makes sense for, for your product. They're not order dependent because they're key value pairs. Um, so you might end up putting the employee um, qualifier, maybe, I'm sorry, the sequence ID in a different location in the message than where we have it. That's fine. Um, also wanna call out on this section because of the call segment, um, and you can see part of that there. That is a child segment. Um, we don't expect multiple times in, so we expect like a time in, time out. So, but it can be repeated. So you just want to make sure that that's uh, that is is aligned with the specifications and how it should work. On the next slide, there's a little bit more on the visit overview because this is a big piece of the of the program. Um, the procedure code validation, and I want to make sure that this is called out because I've worked with some some vendors, providers, and some of the MCOs on this recently since we're getting ready for hard claims edits. And I know that everybody wants to get paid. Um, so the payer program code, I'm sorry, the payer ID, payer program, procedure code, and modifiers must match to a valid record defined in the service addendum. So I just wanted to kind of read that specifically. And those, those call, those, uh, that table is there, and we're going to show that in a moment. We saw some issues with claims um, during soft edits around the wrong payer being transmitted to Sandata from the EVV uh, vendor system. Um, it's important, however that works, whatever that's supposed to, to be, um, if, if a provider is contracted with a certain um, health plan, that that's what's in the data in aggregator, because otherwise when the, when the uh, health plan submits those claims, they won't match. Um, so if you, if you do have some issues with that, then certainly uh, we need to help you guys with that. The biggest thing is gonna be the providers checking their data in aggregator, which they will have access to. Um, that's, that's super duper important. There were, like Dara talked about, we do have a couple of uh, changes and additions to the payer program services. So uh, those will be you know, in play and, and needed to be coded on your side, which will make sure we point those out to you. Um, the client identifier must match to an existing client record. We're going to talk about some things around that in a moment. Same thing with employee identifier. Um, those optional segments are required based on the condition for the segment. So just an example of that one, if a change is required for a visit previously sent to us, then the updated visit will require the visit change segment. Makes sense. So just wanted to kind of call that out for you guys um, and make sure that was, was clear so speaking of the, the first one there, if we move down, the next section kind of talks about the service and modifiers. On to the next screen, please. There we go. Um, this is kind of just a screenshot of the, the top section. This is it's um, section 911, uh, payer program service and modifiers. Uh, this is how it's been laid out. Uh, we did add claims validation rule, um, which aligns to um, the either if it's a unit or per visit. Um, and so we can, we can help you guys with that if we need to, that it's in the specifications though. So hopefully that'll help you out. And we've coded in, or we've highlighted in red, which is on the next screen, um, the additional, this one back, please. Sorry about that, Jesse. That's okay. Hold on one second. There we go. There you go. So just to call out, these are, they're not in this order. And so it's kind of hodgepodge here, but it's these three that are the uh, new uh, Hicks fix codes and modifiers that are going to be um, implemented as of 1-1-2023. Uh, I can't even say that, 2023. Um, so just to, to make sure everybody's aware of those, they're in red right now. Uh, 
So let's go to the next section. There are kind of alluded to us kind of maybe talking a little bit about the exceptions, uh, whether they're fixable or acknowledgeable. So I've broken them down for you guys in this, in this PowerPoint. Um, and exceptions are the way we drive alignment for the data within the Arizona program. It, we, we know a lot of times visits are 100% clean, they're captured electronically, everything's done, boom, you're good. Every once in a while, there are things that can't, can't be sent or for whatever reason. So there are two things that, uh, two types of, of exceptions that are in play in Arizona. One uh, type is fixable. For fixable items, and you can see over here what the list are, um, those are those require the visit to be resubmitted with those fixes actually sent in the in there and, and information about those, and that's all lined out in the specs. Um, and you can see over here on the ex, uh, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied on the left side, um, you, there could be things that could cause rejections that are not except exceptions per se. Um, if you send an invalid service code, we're gonna we're gonna reject that before it even gets into the account. So you'd have to resend that. Um, but they're, so they're not acknowledgeable, right? That would have to be completely fixed if there was no if that was a, if it was a missing service over here. Um, visits without in calls and without out calls have to be fixed in the source, so your vendor system, and then resubmitted to uh, to the aggregator as an update to an existing visit. Um, and again, this kind of, we want to make sure that things can get, the visits can get to the proper status so claims can be matched and you'll be in compliance with Cures Data and all the EVV program requirements Arizona has too. So that's real important. The next slide talks about visit exceptions that are acknowledgeable. So these just require an acknowledgement um, and you would submit a visit exception acknowledgement section visit changes if, you know, if needed. Um, some of them such as like no show or uh, unscheduled visits. So if you don't send a schedule or if there was no schedule and you have to send the unscheduled visit, then you'd have to um, send us that information as to why there was no schedule. They're kind of alluded to that before and she has more information about that in their um, business requirements crosswalk document. So kind of a, kind of both list require different things, but they are, anytime there's items that are not 100% electronically captured fully that would get it to the verified status in SAN data so that claims could be processed against them. All right, next slide, please. A couple of more pieces of information on the visit segment. The alternate EVB system is expected to be able to handle a visit that crosses calendar days for a maximum of 24 hours. Now, th that's kind of the longest visit that's available. We, we kind of have a 25 hour boundary because sometimes people have clock in later out early or late, um, but, the, but it's, a, it's expected to cross a calendar day for 24 hours maximum. So I know there's some visits that occur like that. Um, adjusted in date time and adjusted out date time elements. Big piece of this is that they're only meant to be sent if there's an adjustment. Um, we don't expect those uh, in a visit that's already that, or that's electronically captured and then there's, there's no adjustments to be made. And we're also not looking for them to be adjusted to align with the schedules. Um, so just that's a kind of a, just a reminder. Um, again, just kind of harping on this uh, and maybe beating a, a dead horse, sorry about that. Changes in acknowledgements, a um, couple of things there, send the change long and reason code um, for acknowledgements or subsequent transmissions. Um, and then anything that's a acknowledgement of a non-fixable exception, right? So we want to make sure that there's some specific pieces of information that are aligned there. Whew. Okay, so now let's kind of briefly touch on some common support issues. Um, these are in some of these. Some of this information is in the, the specifications. I'm going to let Dara talk first on the, her piece of it, and then I'll talk some about some of the specifications and things we've seen. All right, everybody. Danielle, for some reason, I'm not able to start my video. Can you check that? Sorry, we, everyone. We've been having a little bit of um, issues today with with uh, uh, connectivity. 
but I'll just go ahead and get started. It's not important that you see me necessarily. Just saying I'm blocked from starting my video, Danielle. Um, but we'll keep moving. Um, common issues and resolutions. So just in general, I'll kind of provide some just general things and then Testy will get into more technical things. Um, I stated this before and I'll state it again. It's very, very, very important for the all TVV vendors and the providers to review and understand um, the business requirements along with the technical specifications um, because they do very much go hand in hand. Um, and oftentimes, um, actually we were just fielding a bunch of questions late yesterday and early today um, in preparations for today's webinar, it was clear that folks really hadn't consulted those documents. So um, we, we spent a lot of time on them to try to make sure that we could be as clear as possible. Um, so please make sure to look at those. Um, for providers using alternate vendors um, and as vendors, please remind your providers that are contracted with you um, to review the aggregator. Um, that's the Sandata aggregator and they can see what data Sandata access and the health plans are receiving. So this is, um, so vendors, we really need you to, to remind your providers of this. Um, and uh, for those of you who've used it, I'm sure that you found it helpful. We have some helpful uh, tools on our website. Um, Tessie went over this, but um, I want to just address that again, to send the service code data as it's listed in the specifications. Um, the reason why we limited, you'll only see certain modifiers, even though providers may be able to bill with other modifiers. So providers should continue to bill how they normally bill with those modifiers, but we've limited the modifiers in the specifications to only those that are present in prior authorizations issued by the health plan. Otherwise, you would have a specification of like thousands <laughs> of modifiers. So we've limited it um, just to support um, uh, the prior authorization process and those um, connections, but, um, but providers can still bill with additional modifiers. Um, this is also very important. Um, we find, um, we found out recently that some of the vendors were rounding the visit data um, to what, how they would sort of round when it came to billing. So it's that converting the actual time to units. Do not do that. Send the exact call in and call out time to Sandata um, because it will not match and it will not support the claims validation process. So we need the exact call in out, the call in and out time. And then uh, Tessie also brought this up before, make sure the correct payer is sent with the visit data. Tessie, I'll turn it back over to you. Awesome, thanks, Dara. All right, so a few things on the common support issues. And some of this, you know, we're gonna have some, some pieces of information, maybe some things that you can do or look for, and then uh, how we can help you. Um, so invalid credentials, right off the bat, if you get this message back when you send a JSON, pretty much that means that something hasn't been set up correctly, the cr credentials aren't right. And you don't, I should, wouldn't waste a lot of time if, uh, trying to troubleshoot that one. If you get that error, just email us. There's your best friend email again, azaltevv at sandata.com. And someone like Carolyn or someone will be glad to help you out, make sure that uh, you get that resolved so that you can send that information to us and your providers will get paid. Alrighty, let's go to the next one. Client not found, as you, you may get this error code 1021. Um, basically, the, this means the client doesn't exist in the agency account. Um, we're not gonna be able to take it because uh, it's, we don't know who, who it really should go to. Um, what can you do to troubleshoot? Uh, again, just like Dara talked about, say, uh, checking the a state aggregator to ensure the client record is in the, in the provider's agency account. Um, you can also check the alt EVV addendum, which is our specifications, for the format to ensure the correct value for the client is in the correct field. And then ensure the cl visit client identifier matches the client identifier on the client record. So obviously if you get a rejection uh, of that and you can figure out what's wrong with it, resend it, that's great. If you have continued issues, again, you're gonna wanna email us and have us help you out with that one. All right, next one, please. 
So similar to client not found, worker not found. This is a 1031. Um, the same kind of scenario could be that the identifier isn't, the employee identifier isn't correctly formatted. Uh, if it's uh, a not, if we're expecting that nine digit ID and it's got a leading zero and it gets dropped, that could uh, cause the problem. Um, again, what you can do is check to make sure the format is there correctly and you have the correct value. And then if you can't figure it out, you can email us and we can uh, help you out. Remember that, you know, adhering to the specifications um, is, is really designed so we don't have, you know, data issues or anything that, that wouldn't be um, able to be, to be a claim submitted against it or that it would be the wrong information in an account. So a lot of these rules are in place to make sure that we can kind of keep things properly aligned. All right, next one. There's a couple of things that could cause this error, uh, which is the uh, visit record service ID error code 553 in the visit record. This would mean that it's a missing service, just like we've been talking about. It has to be specific to the, to the Arizona program. Um, what you can do is check that addendum again, make sure it's right. Um, if you can't, if you can't figure it out or you're having problems and you don't know why it's failing, then um, we can certainly assist you with that. You can email us. On the next slide, there's a root cause number two. And this one is probably the one that we see um, more commonly. And, it, and this is pretty, I wanted to kind of call this out and make sure. Not only are services uh, and modifiers uh, aligned to Arizona's program, they are also case and order sensitive. So if in the specifications, it's capital S 5125 and the modifiers are, are U7 and UA, and those are all capital letters, it has to be sent exactly like that. If you were to put a lowercase uh, lower in any of those, it would be an invalid service combination. If you were to put, um, you know, if you were to put UA first instead of U7, again, it's, it's an it's a invalid combination. Some of them are not, ordered like you think they would be, so you just have to check the specifications. Same troubleshooting steps, check the addendum, um, resubmit or um, contact us about it if you need to need some further assistance. All right, on the next slide, we're gonna talk about some integration best practices. And I kind of alluded to this earlier. We want you to send your clients or members first, send them as soon as possible, and then check to make sure that those are loaded successfully have the provider check and make sure they're in the aggregator before um, you, can, you can get that information to move on. Employees, same thing. And then you send the visits once the clients and employees have loaded. That's really important. If we don't have a client, we can't put a visit with them. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the timing on some of this stuff in just a moment, but then continue to send visits on, on your defined schedule. I'm, I'm hoping everybody has some type of schedule that you send data on so that your provider knows when they can expect it. Um, and then send new clients as they're created or records are updated, send employees as they're created or records are updated. So I'm gonna, talking about the timeliness of data, I'm gonna kind of turn that back over to Dara for a moment. Sure, I um, just wanna highlight that um, really, again, just something for you all to think about. Um, uh, we are hearing a lot of times from providers that the, um, you know, they're claiming for the services and the data hasn't yet been sent. So the, the claim is being rejected. It's not passing claims validation. Of course, we've addressed in the billing checklist and other, um, other resources and told people you should check the aggregator before you claim to make sure that all the visit data is there. But um, it's just something to think about and have a conversation with, with the providers that you're serving um, and servicing, um, because um, we don't want to, we want to make sure that the timing of everything is happening. So we don't really have a set standard of, you know, how quickly you need to send the data. But I will tell you that probably as we approach the hard edit deadline, it's probably going to be important for you to have that conversation with your providers. Um, um, or if you're on the phone today and you're a provider, um, you know, you want to make sure you check the aggregator, but you want to have a discussion with your vendor if, you, if you're seeing that you're getting those soft edits now, um, because there's just simply a time between when the vendor sends the data and um, when the uh, claim is submitted to the health plan. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Slide. 
So considerations for future updates. So these are things that um, we've talked about um, scheduling compliance. So right now, as we talked about earlier, you technically you're you're when the vendor sends the record to Sandate, if it doesn't have a schedule, it won't reject. Um, we're doing that to give you a little bit more of a grace period with the scheduling. Um, but if we're seeing that that um, those two components are not there, um, then we will require it in the future. So it's kind of kind of putting on notice a little bit. Um, and we've talked about what the scheduling compliance means, either a schedule or a reconciliation of the unscheduled visit exception. Um, for verification, this will for sure happen in a future um, update because we're asking Send Data to do the same thing as, as well. And this is important for audit documentation. Um, we are going to require the date and time that the member designee verified the visit. Um, um, so we will require that in a future update. It, this will be after um, the first of the year. And then another item that's compliance related, which we may or may not do, depending upon what we see as far as compliance, um, that will, this is the, the having the full kind of audit stream of the any adjustments or um, updates to the visit um, will require um, this in order for a visit to get to a verified state. So again, we'll, you know, in the future, if we're seeing that there isn't compliance around that audit trail, um, of data submitted, um, then we will, um, you know, invoke um, some kind of stricter restrictions um, in the future. We don't want to do that. Um, we want you all to, to be able to comply. Um, and um, so we don't have to go down that route, but we will do that if we just see that we're not getting that. And again, that's largely because of um, something we need for audit documentation, but also because we're being held accountable by CMS to um, present this data to them as well in an aggregate. Next slide, I'll talk a little bit about the operational reviews. Um, we still have some things to flesh out. Um, we do want to make them um, pretty streamlined. We don't want to make them any more, um, uh, uh, I should say, sizable than they need to. Um, so our basic requirements are we're going to look at those critical uh, key components to confirm compliance with the CARES Act, and then some of the priority business and policy requirements of access. Um, it will be a demonstration format, and we would certainly encourage um, vendors to have at least a provider representative um, part of the demonstration, just so we can ask some questions about how things work um, sort of at the provider agency level or the caregiver level with respect to some of the policy compliance items. Um, we still haven't worked out the details of this, but um, these are again in early 2023. So we'd like the reviews to coincide with the compliance timeline for the updated, for having your updated or things in production that align now with the updated specifications. So um, after we kind of get past this point, we'll start to flesh it out. We do plan on um, over the course of the last three, maybe four years, we've been working with some various provider cohorts um, to help um, review things, discuss things, dialogue with us. So we will do that as well. We'll flesh this out a little bit more and we'll vet it with the provider cohorts to make sure we have that perspective. Um, but again, we want them to be streamlined. There'll be a demonstration format um, and uh, will coincide um, the time the time frame for those operational reviews when we um, want uh, you all to be in compliance with the updated specifications. Next slide. So these are some resources. Um, these are hyperlinks. These are all on the Access EVV webpage. Um, so you definitely, these are the things that we've most readily addressed in this session, but there's a host of other things available on the website. And then I think the next slide is just um, uh, sort of help. Yeah, where do you go? So I'm actually seeing quite a few um, uh, questions in the chat that are really access policy questions. So we may not answer those today um, just because we want to make sure that we answer some of the more technically based questions or as a result of the technical specifications. But you can reach out to us 
Um, Danielle and I answer primarily Danielle, you hear mostly from Danielle, um, this EVV at azaccess.gov email address. We're very responsive. So please submit your policy questions there. So again, if we don't address some of them today, um, then you're welcome to uh, email us so we can respond. And then, um, Tessie, do you want to talk about the SAN data on demand and also the SAN data technical customer support? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Dara. Um, yeah, and a lot of these questions uh, Carolyn was just pointing out to me um, are in our SAN data on demand. It's a really good resource. I would suggest if you do have a question that we that comes up later on that you check there. Um, and if you still can't find the answer, then certainly um, email or call us. Um, again, there's our email, alt, az, alt, evv at sandata.com. Um, and there'll, there'll be some pieces of information that uh, they'll ask you for, trying to get all the information they can. And then our support team will, will happily work with you to answer those questions. But that Sand Data On Demand is a resource that we've uh, put together that should answer a lot of questions um, uh, right off the bat and help you guys out so that you can be self-serving. And I think we're gonna now turn it over to, I think Amanda, and then I think Danielle will offer um, backup support to, to um, ask the questions that have been, uh, to verbalize the questions that have been put in the chat. And then Tessie and I may tag team or <laughs> we'll, think, we'll fight over who gets to answer the question, <laughs> depending. So um, I don't know how you wanna proceed, but uh, Amanda, you're welcome to. To start to raise those questions. Thanks, Dara. Um, so I'm just, I scrolled up significantly to get to, it looks like the first one from Taronda. Uh, it states for the ag visit details history, is there a reason code table or dictionary? She said she couldn't find one in the online manual. So I am assuming you're asking about which the, the actual code numbers and what they mean and what, what should be sent. That is in the specifications and, and um, uh, section 9.3. Uh, it has an exception code. So like zero is unknown client. Um, 23 is missing service. So I believe that's what you're referring to. Those are in the specifications. So you'd send the code um, and that's what it means. And it also tells in the specifications, um, you know, a little bit more about the actual uh, exception itself. Uh, whether it's fixable, acknowledgeable, what we need to know. All right. The next question comes from Natalie. Just please review the technical requirements for the secondary alternate EVV method. They have a web-based primary EVV method, but if the provider is unable to log on, they are using a phone call check-in, either cell phone or landline or key fob. And she's asking, what items are required to be captured for this to be acceptable? So that's the, I think she's asking about just like the CURES Act requirements. So the specifications gotcha. outline all the data that's really required um, to a company as well as the optional data. So um, I think that's really more of a policy question, but things that the CURES Act requires are, is the member, um, the person providing the service, the location, um, the service provided, the start and end time of the service. Those are the basic requirements. All right, the next question comes from Amber stating, their current vendor is currently credentialed with Send Data, but they're switching vendors um, in February of next year. So they're reaching out when they reach out to get credentials for the new vendor. They're wondering if they could schedule it so that their current vendor doesn't get cut off from Send Data before they switch. Carolyn, can, are you able to come off mute and, and help with that question? Sure, thank you. Um, hi, this is Carolyn. So yes, when you put in your request to switch vendors, we will ask that you give us what is your end date for the first vendor and your start date for the new vendor. And we will enter that end date in on that account. So um, the, the first vendor that you're switching out of, they will be able to send data up into including whatever that end date is. They can continue to um, do any updates to visits as necessary, as long as those visit dates do not pass the, the end date, they will get a rejection at that point. 
Um, but hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. All right, next question. Um, seems like, again, it's more curious related from Deborah inquiring, is scheduling required for live-in? So that's a policy, policy. question. Yep. You want me to that's skip over it? That's a policy question. The answer is no, and there's plenty of information on our webpage. Then there's a specific FAQ for live-in caregivers. And then, Dara, Courtney is asking for clarification for items that are required in the business requirements, but not in the spec and what the implications are. Do you want to handle that in this chat? Um, so, I mean, basically, uh, adherence to the business requirements is basically adherence to access policy, and the health plans will be monitoring compliance against those, um, those requirements, as well as access will be as well. Okay, there's a question from Matt. He says, so for scheduling a discrepancy between Syndata specs and Arizona business rules, the visit does not have a schedule start time and schedule end time. Will it be verified in Sunita's aggregator portal and pass claims validation? If it doesn't have the scheduled start time and scheduled end time, we would be ex expecting the um, exception to be sent to get it to a verified status. So it doesn't necessarily have to have the scheduled start time and end time. It has to have either start time and end time or um, the exception and change log information as to why um, it was an unscheduled visit. Okay. Let's see. And if you, if any, if I just want to just say that if someone finds an example of where they think that the language in one document doesn't comport with the other one, we'd actually like you to send that to us just so we can double check. Um, or if we need to add a further clarification, we'd be happy to do that. Um, so you can send that to the EVB address. We want to be as explicitly clear as we can be. So if, we're, if it, for some reason you're reading it differently, we want to take a look at it. And that means send it to Dara. Our yes. support team's not going to, they're going to be like, we don't, they're, they're not going to know what what we've talked like that we need to align with that doc. They'll have that document, but they're not gonna know how to make changes or answer questions about that kind of stuff. Yep. Okay, next question comes from Nikki. For a home health visit, skilled providers may not schedule a specific time for a visit. For example, a provider has four clients they need to see on a given day, but there isn't a specific time assigned and they're wondering how that should be handled. Yep, that's a policy-related policy. question. Okay. Yep. All right, getting down. Um, let's see, Deborah is asking, wouldn't the relationship modifier note the need for no schedule and not require an additional note? Um, not necessarily. Um, are you, I'm assuming you're referring to the modifier for the live-in caregiver. Um, we, we did look at potentially some ways. Um, so right now in the SAN data system, there isn't really an easy way to flag a worker that if they're a live-in caregiver, we have talked about it. I would say that if there's an alternate vendor that has a way to do the flag in their system and sort of fast track um you know to try to streamline the visit maintenance process we would certainly um we'd be happy to have that discussion we just need to make sure that all the documentation is there um but there potentially could be a way that somebody could streamline the visit maintenance so for example the unscheduled visit exception instead of that flagging all the time they could potentially set up a way in their system and that certainly would be something that we would want to look at during that operational review Okay, next question comes from Cynthia. Most manual adjustments that we make or do do a lot for authorization and what the caregiver clock reduced down, meaning if they're only approved 20 hours but the caregiver was at 20 and a quarter, we adjust them down. Do we need to send a, send a special note for those to send? 
So I'm going to I'm going to let Vera answer part of this, but I'm going to also just kind of mention that what we are looking for in EVB is is what the the caregiver actually provided the service. We want the actual time they clocked in and clocked out. So there could be uh, maybe differences around payroll or something like that. But for the EVB visit, we're not looking for folks to adjust the visits based on the authorization. That's correct. In fact, that would be that would be a, a huge issue for us. We need the actual recorded time. If you need to make adjustments for payroll, then you do that. Um, but um, and I think on the claims validation and when the health plan sends um, the health plan is not going to. So how claims validation works is the health plan is going to perform their own claims validation that they do today. Like they look at the claim to make sure that it lines up with the authorization. And then they go to send data and they ask for send data to verify that there's visits that align with what's been claimed. But if you have more time in the visit than what you're actually claiming for, it'll still pass claims validation. Correct, Tessie? That's correct. But well, it depends on the rule. So there, but most of the time people are using the um the, the rule that will allow that. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. The next question comes from Charmaine saying we have clients who live in rural areas and their address is showing to the nearest post office or chapter house. How do they get their address fixed? So I think that's a question with your vendor. If you're using SAN data, then you need to email us at the EVV email address the, to the access EVV email address. Otherwise, you need to ask that question of your alternate vendor. <clears throat> okay. Pretty certain this one's already been covered as far as reason code exception. Um, Another question from Toronto, will a record fail if there's no contingency plan? I think the contingency plan's optional, right, Tessie? I'm looking, but I'm almost positive it is. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yep. it's optional. So it, right, so the record won't be, won't be rejected, but from a policy standpoint, you do need to have the contingency plan, but if for whatever reason for that particular member, you don't want to have the time that you sent the visit data, it won't reject the visit. Next question comes from Robert regarding the current uh, specification. He's looking for JSON examples. Are they baked in to the agenda, Tessie? They are not. Um, we didn't. We, when we kind of made this, I think that we kind of, we have that there was a separate generic specification that had right. the JSONs in them. Um, our idea was, I think, I'm, maybe, I'm, maybe I didn't get them in here and I should have. And if, if you don't have those and we need to get the generic specifications out there too, or I can add them in here, I can, I can talk with our uh, internal teams and see what would be the best option. We want to try to get everything in one document, um, but certainly we can provide the, that information as well and make sure everybody has it. We do have those generic specifications also on our website. Um, so where we have them located, I think, so we might just wanna make sure Tessie that they're the most up to date, but we do have the generic ones and then we have the Arizona specific addendum. Okay. Yeah, the generic one shouldn't change. Y'all's version for generic will should be always the same. Right. Okay, next question comes from Courtney. Do vendors who are already certified need to be quote unquote recertified? Um, and then her follow-up question was, uh, if Jerry, you could explain the OR process that you mentioned, but you, you covered that. So I think that we're good there, just focusing on if the vendors need to be recertified for home health. So I think Tessie, this is kind of related to, Tessie and I have talked about this. I think they're still, and we're happy to get feedback from folks, but. With the updated specifications, we don't think that there really needs to be a testing process. Um, I guess if you feel like uh, once you complete your development, if you wanna do testing, um, we, we can talk about that, but we were sort of just thinking that because of the nature of some of these updates, 
that there wouldn't necessarily be have to be a testing process so that you wouldn't have to have a recertification, quote unquote, with Sandata. I will tell you the operational reviews, um, you know, our intention with those is not to prohibit any vendor from moving forward. Um, our just intention is to make sure that all vendors are compliant. So we wouldn't, we would develop, if there were things that weren't compliant that needed to be, we'd develop a correction action plan with the vendor, um, have them, you know, complete whatever's necessary. But I don't know, Tess, if you want to say anything more about the testing. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. We, we aren't uh, requiring anybody to recertify on our side. Um, there's, there's nothing in place for that. Uh, certainly, uh, if things come up and, you know, there are some vendors, sometimes I know that when, when changes are made that they like to retest. Uh, and so we can always uh, assist with that as needed. Um, and, but we're not requiring any recertification. All right, <clears throat> next question seems policy related. I'm gonna skip over that. Uh, next question. Actually, uh, yeah. actually, Amanda, the one about the S5151. Yeah, do you want me to read that one out? Yeah, if you could, because I think it's, okay. it, has to talk, it has to do with claims validation. Got it, you okay, something. you got it. So the question from Katie is, has Access and GDD worked out the S5150 that will be in hours, but billed as units? For example, employee puts in 12 and a half um, visit hours, possibly multiple providers. DDD will show one unit. Will that be an issue during payment verification? So the, the, she's referring to testing the per diem respite code. So I believe that we worked with DDD a number of months ago to make sure that they were submitting the appropriate type of validation. So we have different types of claims validation depending upon if it's a per diem code or if it's a like a, a unit code. So um, Katie, I believe that's been addressed. Um, if you're seeing that it's not been addressed, then you need to let us know. But I believe that's what we worked on a couple months ago with DDD. Yeah, and if you look in the specifications in the, in the, the uh, section where it has the payer program services, the claims validation rule, those are listed as rule two, which is a per visit. So rule one is a per unit. Um, and there's some, some, you know, stuff around that, like as far as how many minutes equate to a unit or what that does. But rule two is per visit, period. Okay, next question comes from Cynthia. Should we speak to our vendor if we're noticing exceptions in send data but not able to fix them in our vendor system to resubmit, for example, client signature verification? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Angela is asking, how long should it take to fix an exception? Which um, that's so. So remember that aggregator is a view only, right? So we are. We get the data from the vendors, uh, vendor system. So it, that exception should be fixed on whatever schedule, you know, they're sending that information to us. So uh, I guess that depends on, on your vendor on how long it should take to fix an exception. All right, <clears throat> next question comes from Garrick stating 9.3 exceptions quote unquote visits without in calls says quote unquote note all visits will require the call segment to be provided but when submitting a no show visit general information record we don't have call clock data what call segment should we send i i had this one before let me remember unless carolyn you can jump in because i think if the i think the call segment is um, a conditional segment, or am I remembering it wrong? Yeah, the call segment is a conditional segment because um, if you have a call in and a call out, you're going to have call segment. But if you're updating the visit with a, an adjusted time because you had to correct a time, maybe they forgot to log, you know, the, the the uh the correct time um then if you're sending an adjusted time then that call segment is not required when it comes to the no show that's refer referring to you previously sent the visit with only a schedule and now 
that can't that's canceled, right? So you're you don't you're not going to accept a, expect a claim for that if the if they if the provider never even showed up for the visit, right? So if the if the schedule is getting canceled, then you're not going to have calls, right? Does that make sense? And Garrick, if, if that if that didn't make sense, Garrick, then go ahead and email us at the EVV at um, azaccess.gov and we'll work with Sandata to clarify that in writing. All right, next question comes from Adela. What if a family caregiver clocking um, and out has issues with mobile internet busy with the client and that's the reason why they're not able to clock in or out on time? Or, and we are to fix the time. Are we not allowed to adjust the time? So you need to, that's a policy question. You need Got to it. look at our audit maintenance and documentation FAQ because it, it talks in there like that specific scenario. If that happens, what you need to do about it. The, Dara, I'm gonna lean on you for the next two from Minette and Tiffany, would those more fall under policy? I'm I'm taking a reading here. So we you should not um, again. I think this kind of goes back to what we talked about before. Your system should be sending the actual times that the visit began and the actual times that the visit ended. If you um, need to make an adjustment for payroll reasons. Um, then you need to make that separately. That shouldn't occur with, you shouldn't be adjusting. Um, the only time you should be adjusting times is if there wasn't a call in or a call out, or there was an instance where the person, you know, arrived and then, you know, it was a half an hour later, they remembered, oh, I got a call in. And then you, there needs to be an adjustment, but you shouldn't generally be retroactively making adjustments um, to support payroll or billing. You should just be sending the actual time, start and end time. Okay. And you should in no way, in no way, shape or form should you be modifying schedules after the scheduled start, start time uh, has been initiated. I think we can go to Toronto's question. Yeah, the next, so the next one from Toronto, okay. uh, what about bad underscore request error? Yep. Yeah, so that's just a, uh, a generic error message, typically um, in your, you know, JSON, uh, whatever system, however you're sending that to us, that, that it couldn't be processed for some reason. <laughs> um, typically, uh, like I use Postman, if I get a bad request, I take the, 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 the ID, the UUID, and put it in the Git and see exactly what it says. It could be, there could be a multiple things. That's a, that's kind of a generic error. Um, so it wouldn't be specifically related to like anything. It could be specifically related to something in the, um, in the JSON itself that didn't work right, but it's not specifically related to our specifications. So that's really more technical um, and, and a, a, a overall error that means something's wrong with the way you have it or your, uh, or your actual connection or something like that. Tessie, could I just uh, jump in yeah, here for one second? Absolutely. So a bad request can happen if there's something not formatted correctly in the data. For example, you have an extra space before or after the provider ID or, you know, uh, you missed a squiggly somewhere, right? Something simple like that, right? That can cause it or also um, if you attempt the get status response and you didn't use the complete and correct UUID value, then you're going to get a bad request uh, re response back. So you have to make sure you use the correct, accurate, complete UUID that was provided in your acknowledgement. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Dara, for the next question from Cassie, is that one, I think we pretty much covered it, but I just wanted to double yeah. check with you. 
I think that's the same I, I thing think, we were just talking about. Yeah. Right. I just want to make sure that you don't adjust. I, I think they, Tessie, as I read it, it's correct with one exception. You don't round. When you make an adjustment to a visit, you should be making an adjustment to the call in or call out time based upon when it actually began. You don't round it. Um, correct. You, you make the adjustment. So if, again, Tessie was supposed to show clock in at eight, but she's taking care of me and she forgot and it's eight, you know, 25 when she actually did call in, but it needs to be back to eight o'clock because that's when, when she officially started, it's eight o'clock. You don't, you, but you shouldn't be rounding it. All right, that the next, sense. next question just pertains to this town hall. Um, Cynthia is asking if they can get a copy of all the questions and the associated answers from this call. So we're definitely recording today. We're gonna post it to the website along with the um, PowerPoint. I think we'll try to answer these questions in some sort of format or incorporate them into other FAQs. Um, but give us a little bit of time because there's a lot of questions, but I, I would view the recording probably um, first off and then we'll also try to do some sort of written response. All right, Tessie, so Christy is asking, does Cindy to have a guide that lists all the error codes and possible causes troubleshooting? So we have the ones um, that we, we, we talked about um, in our specifications, I thought that now, yeah, field level errors. Um, Carolyn, does one of the other documents have other yeah. errors or information? If they go to send data on demand and they go to the EVV vendor solutions, there's a tab that's called EVV vendor solutions documentation that has error handling guide. There's also a tab that says EVV Vendor Solutions FAQ. And so there's uh, several FAQ documents in there. And between those two documents, that, that should help them out. If they don't find the answer to their question, then they can email support. All right, the next question, um, from, I'm gonna probably mispronounce this, um, Joyzy, how do we send a client first? I noticed our vendor just sends the client an employee when the first visit is completed. Yeah, and, and that's a good question. And maybe, I, you know, that's something I can take away. Um, really, it, we're talking about the JSON. So we would want them to have it, you know, if they're gonna send the, the data all together, we just want it in that order, if they're sending it like that, just so it's not the visit and then, uh, you know, that information. Um, and specific, some vendors send them different ways. So, you know, I, I think that that should be fine if you're not having any errors or any problems with visits um, or rejections, you know, based on client or employee not being there. Um, so that should be, you shouldn't, that should be fine. Just really quick, Tessie, and you just mentioned that, um, having the client or the, if they send the client, the employee and the visit at the same time, and the visit record happens to process before the client and, or the employee, they will get a re reject on the visit. So that's why in earlier in this presentation, we had suggested to send all the clients first, all the employees that then start sending the associated visits. And if you have a client or employee new or updates, you know, then send those as needed. Um, but just beware, if you send them all at the same time, there's no guarantee that that client record will process first, the employee process second, and the visit will process third. <laughs> All right, Dara, I'm gonna jump over. There's a, there was a question that got posted to the Q&A from Russ. Um, he says, all of our DDD clients are still not in our Syndata account, however, their visits are showing up in the aggregator visit review. Will that be an issue for claims payments? I think, Russ, you're a SAN data user. Um, so you'll need to um, 
direct that question to us at the EVV email address, the azaccess.gov. If I'm if I'm wrong, if you're using an alternate vendor, then please restate. But um, I think this is something that we need to check out with e, uh, with DVD specifically. And and I'm a little puzzled as if the visits are there, how the clients aren't there. Right. Thank you. So, I reread that. <laughs> yeah. So I'm maybe like, you could. Yeah. I thank you. I reread that. You're right. I just see authorizations and clients. You <laughs> know, um, but. Yeah, I'm not sure how that would happen because San Data wouldn't accept the visit data. Um, so, Russ, maybe you can email us and we can kind of try to troubleshoot with you. He says they use Access Care. Oh. Hmm. So how could they? Okay, so he uses a he does use an alternate vendor. Yeah, I still again if if, if the visit's there for the client, then the client has to be there so puzzled yeah what so email us let's see is, yeah so should they he email te the all tvd technical support then since that seems since he's using an alternate vendor um should that be the all tvd technical support yeah yeah okay. and, and he, in the aggregator i mean i guess i, I we would probably need to to get have him get with our, our team but in the aggregator you know they you can't see the clients right you can only see the visits so that's why i'm like not i'm not sure but yeah prep definitely email uh our alt az alt evv at sandata.com um and please provide as much space as possible we'll see what we can figure out for you all right let me go back to the chat um question from sue have you made any upgrades to the portal so the visit id we send will be visible in the portal it's very hard to match up data without that common link therefore hard to audit claims before billing and i am assuming that this is the visit other id from the alt evv vendor um I am not 100% sure. I can check. No, the visit ID, that visit other ID is not visible okay. in the portal at this time. If they'd like to, if they'd like to um, put in a, um, a request for that enhancement, you can send that email in. There you go. All right, next question um, is from Cassie to clarify the removal of quote unquote missing Medicaid ID. Their system sends false when the client has a Medicaid ID. Do they need to update this to be null? Nope, you can still send false. If it's a default, that's fine. We just had some, we had some questions around it and we found some, uh, some inconsistency. So, uh, you know, there, there's very few instances where it's applicable, um, and once it's once it's sent as true, it it kind of you know causes some things that then have to be um, looked at and fixed. And and for claims, especially when it gets around to that, if if it accidentally gets sent as true and there's truly a Medicaid ID, then that could be a problem. But if uh, if it's already set to false and you're sending it, then um, that's fine. Sarah, for the next two questions from Morgan and Priscilla, are those, how do you want to handle those? So I think Morgan's is a good question to try to clarify. Um, and Priscilla, your question is, is uh, referred to the, um, the new uh, visit maintenance and documentation FAQ, but I think Morgan's is a good question to raise. Okay, so Morgan's asking, does a verified status in send data mean the claim will be paid 100%? It does not. So this goes back to our example earlier that we were talking about. We had a, uh, a provider claims, they, they, were, they were struggling. Their, all their visits in aggregator said verified. Claims were denied. Problem was the vendor was sending the wrong payer. Our system is looking at the pieces of information in the specifications. We don't know who you're submitting claims with. So that's why we were really harping on, providers need to check aggregator and make sure the information is correct and what it's supposed to be. Our system is looking at, does 
the information we're receiving align with the pieces of information in the specification. Not, we don't have any idea who, uh, if you're using an alternate EVV vendor, who you are contracted with to, uh, to, be, to have your claims paid. The other caveat is that the health plans, just like they did before EVV, have their own claim edit that they look at when you submit a claim. So um, it is true that with respect to EVV, you should, if it says verified, that's, that's sort of like the push to, okay, now you can go ahead and claim, but the health plan has their own edits that they apply to claims all the time. So just because it says verified in the system from a Sandata perspective, um, if everything was right, you had the right payer and everything, it could pass Sandata validation, but it may not pass the health plan's validation. So that's why you have to understand your billing requirements and everything for the health plan. But generally, yes, that means it's a good start. <laughs> yes, that's when, you should, that's when you should send the claim when you've got it to a verified state but it doesn't 100% guarantee payment because there's other things that may play, play into that. And I think the other question, the one from Priscilla about the build out devices and where do we get the codes for service? So I'm assuming she's asking about using uh, like telephony, using the telephone to uh, an IVR. Um, so that would be the um, call guides, right? Those have the list of services mm -hmm. and um, that would be, provided to the, um, provided to them, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Let's see, next question from Taronda. In the history, there's a reason code for the type of history logged. Doc lists reason codes for exceptions, but she's asking about reason codes listed for history. Oh, the reason and resolution codes are are there. They're under the services uh, under the services section. Um, the reason codes uh, one through thirteen, and the resolution codes are like two through eight, and then some uh, alphabetic ones. Um, those are listed uh, in the in the specifications. It's like page thirty three and thirty four. Kudos to you for knowing <laughs> exact pages, Tessie. Um, what? We have a question from Desiree. What are the reasons or exceptions for unscheduled visits? So that's in the visit maintenance and documentation FAQ on our website. We go through those different scenarios and highlight for you what exceptions apply and what would be some appropriate reason and resolution codes to clear the exception and get the visit to a verified state. Okay, right. next question comes from Nick. Please elaborate on the location data requirements for alternate methods. If a secondary method is either a landline call-in option or a key fob setup, does location data requirement need to be GPS coordinates, geolocation, is landline verification of phone number okay? Obviously the methods we're using, are we're referring to our offline access. Is that y'all there or I'm? Um, I think he's wondering like how you how you record the location if it's not like a mobile phone and there's not like, there's not the GPS. There's other ways to oh. denote location, right? Yes. I'm assuming yeah. that's what Nick means. Okay, yeah. Uh, so there's the visit location type is a an element and that's, there's just a two defined values for that one's home and one's community. Um, if it's the phone, you know, if you're using, if they're calling in via phone, um, we're not capturing GPS or anything like that. Right. So the specs, the specs actually outline that the call latitude and call longitude are related to mobile. Um, so I, I don't know, Nick, if we're not getting to your question, you can send it to us afterwards. We're not understanding your question. Next question comes from Brian. Is there a set number for allowable exceptions? So uh, we address this in our audit document, audit maintenance and documentation FAQ. Sorry to sound like a broken record, but it really is addressed in there as far as our um, expectations around exceptions, manual visits, things like that. So we have a statement in there regarding that. 
<clears throat> okay. Um, next question from Alex seems policy related, Dara. Now, yeah, I'm actually not sure. I think no? that's asking about the billing module. Okay, you want me, I, I can gladly read it. So Alex is asking, do we need to create and submit invoices using Cindy to EV after ensuring all visits are in verified status? So this is a really great question. Uh, Arizona has an optional billing module, which, uh, well, if you're if you're using EVV, right, then you should be able to see it. That's the only reason I think that's what Alex may be talking about is because that's where the create and submit invoices are. You would only be using that if you are, are, are using our system to send 837s. And I, we have maybe two providers that are doing that. It, whatever your process is currently for submitting invoices, and Dara, correct me if I'm wrong, you can use that. You do not are, and are not required to use Send Data EVV um, for the billing module. It's on or it shows up in, in our EVV system for alternate Vendors and alternate providers, you're probably going. I don't know what you're talking about, um, but it, it's uh, it's there, but it's it's not physically usable until there's a bunch of setup and stuff that's done. So, uh, any I'll leave the rest of that to Dara if she wants to add anything. Yep, no, that's correct. You bill unless you want to use, unless you're a Sand Data user and you want to use their billing module, you bill and claim for services just like you did before EVB. And if you do want to use the billing module, then you have to contact us. Then we have to get some information, do a bunch of things and uh, and get that all set up, so. Okay. Um, living caregivers, we already addressed. Uh, let's see. Scrolling down. Um, let's see, there is a question from Brandon. He's not certain if it's a policy question. He's looking for clarification. For the EVV billing checklist required for EVV payers, Mercy Care and Mercy Care LTC, but not Mercy Care RHBH. Does Mercy Care RHBH require EVV? Um, so uh, I'm not really sure. Danielle, well, on the billing checklist, do we just not have a specific, we made, uh, my guess is he's, he's referring to the list of um, health plans at the end with the contact information. You would just contact the, this the Mercy Care number. That's not the long-term care number. I think they give two different places to contact. So yes, there are um, providers who are contracted with the Mercy Care Reba line of business that are subject to EVD. All right, next question comes from Dan. How do we handle issues with the providers not being able to clock in or out with their mobile device? So again, if you're a Sandata user, this, um, this webinar is really about alternate users or alternate vendors. Um, so non-Sandata vendors and how they connect um, into the uh, e larger EVV system. So if you have a question, if I don't, I'm not sure if that's a device issue, or maybe you are from using an alternate vendor and you're asking about how to clear an exception. Um, but those are policy related questions. Or if you have a device issue, then you need to contact Send Data. Dara, the next question from Alex or Tessie, I'm not certain if we how we want to answer this one regarding um, resource support. So I guess it depends on what what resource support they're looking for. Right. And if you're if you're a SAN data user, then you call the SAN data help desk and they will help you. I've seen them help people, you know, for however long a time it takes to help the person resolve the issue. Um, if you have another vendor, then you need to reach out to them for your support. All right, next question. I think Charm oh, go no, no, go ahead. Sorry, Amanda. I was gonna say, um, for Charmaine's asking, how do we handle when a provider keeps getting a temporary password and resets password? 
But then when she logs in, she gets a message saying too many login attempts and her account is disabled. So again, if you're a Send Data user, you need to contact the Send Data Help Desk and have them walk you through any device issues. Um, the Jennifer or Jennifer is asking for the link for Send Data on Demand. Uh, Carolyn, if I could lean on you to put that in the chat just so that it's easily accessible for all participants. Sure. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Yvette is asking on the business requirements crosswalk, there's an update on the services provided during the visit. The update states services provided must align with the source authorization if prior authorization is required by the health plan. Does align mean within the auth period and should this auth number be provided? You don't provide any authorization data to SAN data as an alternate vendor. You just provide the service codes and modifiers for the service. Um, so that just means, um, Yvette, that, um, that we're just saying that you, if, if there's a prior authorization, you need to, you know, you just need to make sure that the service is provided and the visit data aligns with that authorization in your, whether you do that in your, in your, alternate vendor system or however you do that. It was just more of a statement. You don't have to provide anything additional than what's in the specifications. Next question comes from Leticia. Are providers allowed to use their computers to clock in and or clock out? So device options are dependent upon the um, alternate vendor and what device options they have as long as they meet our policy requirements. Um, let's see. Amanda, I'm reading this one from Charmaine. I, yeah. I believe she's asking about the FVV device. It, yeah, that seems does, like it could be do that. Do they, do alternate vendors have options for FVV devices? Or similar like okay. functions. So Charmaine, okay. that's really a policy related question. Okay. Uh, um, Chelsea is asking, will authorizations be available in Send Data for alt vendor users? Nope, we don't no. load authorizations for alternate EVV vendors. All right. Um, Amber is asking, if we use SAM, it is an all EV product from Syndata, then still continue to go to our um, regular login to run regular reports for rejected claims, correct? Yep. Okay. All right, scooting down. Um, Vianne is asking how long does the visit stay staying processed? Forever. Once yeah. it's processed, it's processed. And that means, Tessie, that it's been, um, that it's passed validation, correct? Correct. That the, yep, we, we uh, the health plan said, do you have this visit for this amount of units or visit data type information? We said yes. So that means we have processed it from our side to, to validate the visit versus the claims data. Doesn't mean you're paid, doesn't mean anything like that, but it's processed. Um, Darren, Tessie, for Mikhail's question, how should we? So, yeah, I mean, so there's an issue with them being able to view another company. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure Danielle's probably aware of that ticket. So we need to follow up on that ticket. If And if we're not, you need to, they're saying, Mikhail's saying we are aware of it. Right. Um, but something hasn't been removed. So, um, Mikhail, if you have a ticket number, you could put that in the chat and then we'll follow up. I think I remember this one, but y'all yeah, wait to see the ticket. Okay. Um, let's see, jumping. 
Danielle's asking, we are new to using the whole system. Is there one-on-one -on -one training that's offered? Using the whole system, I, I would imagine that Danielle's referring to Syndata system, unless I'm mistaken. I'm reading into that too much. Yeah, so Danielle, we have on our website under, on the EVV webpage, under resources for providers, there's a one pager for new providers on sort of what your options are and where to go for training and things like that. Um, so maybe our Danielle Ashlock can put a link to that document in the chat, but it is on the EVV webpage on the access website. All right, now I'm scrolling down for any new questions. Um, I think you just answered Maria's question that came in at 1.41 Arizona time. Is there some help to learn how to use EVV system if you've not used it yet? That pertains to the training. Um, let's see. So I see Juan asked if, if verified and processed is, are, are good. So <clears throat> verified means that we've received all the information, pieces of information, any um, exceptions have been cleared. Um, that means it's it is um, a not a, a complete visit, right? So we've we've got every piece of information according to the specifications and the 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 items on the uh, SAN data side, um, and it can have a claim then validated against it. Process means a claim has been validated against it. So those are good visits. Now that does not a hundred percent mean that they are. In compliance with all the uh, policy pieces, right? So there could be some things like that, um, but they are uh, able to be finished, I guess, it, on the on this side. The other status a verified or a process visit might have is approved, and that means that you have the appropriate documentation for member verification. Um, so that's another sort of good, <laughs> good visit status. You don't want incomplete, right? I mean, that's basically the one that you don't want is incomplete, right, Tessie? That's correct. Incomplete, we will, we will never be able to validate that uh, for the health plan on, on as far as a claim. Okay. So there's some. Go ahead. Oh, I jumped ahead. Sorry, Amanda. You're good. No, um, it looks like we just got two new questions. Uh, Garrick asking, do you expect funding sources, for example, DDD, to mark the visit as processed? So it's a system. It's a uh, it's a sand data system uh, thing. When if, if DDD is, is who's processing your claims, once they submit what we call claim validation, uh, they send us a claims request. Um, with the visit information, and we, if if that all aligns, right? So it's the right payer, program member, uh, provider, service, all that good stuff that we're looking for. Date, um, then we send them back uh, that it, we validated it as true, and the visit flips to processed. If it doesn't, if it's not flipping to processed, then the visit has not been validated by by DDD. That means that. We've sent them back uh, information on either there was no visit found for some reason. Doesn't mean the visit's not truly there. Could be the payer was wrong, like we talked about before. Um, that or the, or could be unmatched units. So there is um, there's there's some things like that. If DDD visits are never flipping to process, they haven't sent us claims validation. We'll take it up with DDD, basically. Yeah, I can guarantee you 100% if we receive a, what we call it, it's called a request, uh, a, a claims request file. We send back a claims response file within two to three hours. Let's just a little bit, a little bit of window, right? Um, and uh, once that claims request has been processed and responded to, that visit flips. It's it's not a DDD issue it, or, I mean, it, well, it's a DDD issue because that means they haven't sent it to us, so. And the best way to go about if you're seeing, um, if you have verified visits, but they're not transitioning to process, go to the billing checklist. And at the end of the billing checklist are is contact information for the health plan. Sometimes it differs 
based upon line of business, reach out to them and say, this is what's happening. And you probably should do that now <laughs> because we want to make sure we don't have any hiccups when it gets to, it may enlighten them to something that, that's not happening correctly or what have you. You're certainly welcome to keep us in the loop, but you need to email the health plan directly because that's not something Access is going to have sight into nor is San Beto. So that response seems to cover what Juan and Rick just posted. Correct. Yeah. So yeah. they may, like I said, and I don't want to just clarify, they may have sent us the, the claims validation, but that means that the claim did not match completely to what's in, in EBV. Um, so that's that's the piece of it. They're, they will have gotten a response that told them some piece of information. That's where the provider going back to the aggregator to check and make sure uh, that it has everything it needs to. They should be able to provide that um, information back to you so that you can then see what's happening and if something needs to be fixed or if something's wrong. I checked, I'll give you an example. I checked on some the other day. I, I think it was for Banner. Um, and to me, uh, what was happening was the claim was being, the claims validation was being sent based on scheduled times, which were uh, different than the actual uh, visit times. So like it, the, the scheduled time equated to eight units, but the visit time was seven units. We're not gonna validate it because we're saying that visit was only for seven units and the uh, banner was trying to say, is this, was this done for eight units? So we said, nope, that visit's not there because it's not seven, you know, it's not what they what we what we have listed. So uh, that's really important to remember. It's it's based on the actual times, not the scheduled times, too. I'm not seeing any new questions. Christy, I see your information there about the DDD visits. We're switching to process until 9:30. I I know that I've worked with DDD and I know they've sent in claims response files. So. Again, I would definitely reach out and, and see what's going on because we we shouldn't be, we haven't had any claims issues overall. And Mikkel did put her ticket numbers in the chat. Um, she's the one awesome. who had the issue with yep. seeing, so we'll follow up on that. Thank you, Mikkel. Amanda, maybe we can go back to the help um, slide. So Tiffany, you're asking about a policy Q&A meeting. We, we have them kind of regularly with different associations and things like that. Um, it is Danielle and myself. Um, so um, certainly we answer emails all day long related to policy issues at the EVV at azaccess.gov email address. Um, and we utilize those questions that are coming in to help inform our guidance documents by and large. 95% of the time, our guidance documents answer the questions. So um, I definitely think that we need to uh, make sure we take a look at what's on the website, um, the access website, and, and, and definitely dive into those before reaching out to us. But we're always here um, and available, happy to help. Layla saying, um, so one, if you're having verified visits that aren't turning into process visits, you need to contact the health plan. It's on the billing checklist that's on the access website. At the end of the billing checklist, it has contact information for the health plans about billing. Um, Layla says, does Evercare and Mercy Care have the same payer code? We don't even have Evercare anymore. I was going to say, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I, we don't, I don't have Evercare. So I'm not sure. They're not a health plan anymore, Layla. So Layla, Layla, sorry. Um, and again, on uh, Jamie, when it says verified, that means that the if, if a if the health plan submitted a claims request uh something didn't match up with what they submitted and what was in evv um could like i said it could be the number of units it could be the service code it could be the date it could be you know multiple things if it's verified that means it, it has not been it had a claim claims information validated against it
Well, thank you for everyone today. Um, definitely lots of really good technical questions. I know it's hard not to ask policy related questions too, but hopefully we answered some of those. Again, by and large, when people email us, we're able to answer the questions by referring back to the documents on our website. Um, so please make sure to take a look at those before you reach out to us here at Access, but we are happy to support you. Um, we want you to be um, um, available, you know, we want to be available to you. Um, and um, Tessie, I don't know if you have any final words before we wrap up. I just definitely want to say thank you, first of all, to Darren and Danielle for all the work that we put in on this. You know, our goal was to be as proactive as we could, uh, because, you know, if we were doing this uh, uh, on in the December and, and going to hard claims edits January 1st, you guys would probably all be panicking. But uh, we wanted to get as proactive as we could and give you as much time as possible. And I also want to say that I know a lot of you had questions about um, the health plans and those kind of things. They have, you know, some of them have been active, more active than others, but they all have been uh, also trying to um, get ahead of these things too. And ha they have asked a lot of good questions. So we certainly appreciate it. And uh, we, we value our partnership with y'all. And I want to thank my cohorts for hanging in there and helping me out so much. Um, and uh, I hope that, uh, that, the, that this has been beneficial, but certainly if you, you know, if, if, if there was something we missed or something you need to know about, let us know and we'll be happy to help you out from the SAN data side. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.